Hello and welcome to Hoax or Holy Grail, the Fox Sisters. When people hear about the Fox Sisters, they typically think of Maggie and Kate, the two young girls who had heard rapping sounds in their home and had then become quite famous for a number of years doing shows and presentations of their skills. The girls moved from Ontario, Canada in 1847 to Hydesville, New York with their parents, John and Margaret. They had four older siblings, but only two are typically mentioned with the events after March 31st, 1848. David, their bro older brother who lived close by, and Leah, who lived in Rochester and was a music teacher. The ages of the girls vary depending on the sources, as this chart demonstrates. Wikipedia was the only source that gave the girls birth dates and date of death. As you can see here, two of the sources list Leah as 34, which makes sense considering events afterwards. I'm not sure how Deborah Blum came up with 16 or thinking that Leah was still living at home when she had already been married, sadly widowed, and was living with her daughter. But as this chart demonstrates, it's important to refer to a number of different sources regardless of the topic that you're researching or looking information up about because as you can clearly see here, there is a variety of different information there. So it depends on what sources they refer to to pull their information together. Maggie's age varies from 14 to 15. Kate's from 11 to 12, which is definitely around the time period and likely accurate given a year or two. So they were quite young when all of this began to happen. According to Deborah Blum and Ghost Hunters, the events began in the spring of 1848. Now in terms of the girls becoming more involved, that's somewhat accurate. But according to the different sources that I referred to, events actually began happening within weeks of the family moving into this particular home. There had been rumors about the house being haunted, no explanation of why that rumor was around. But the family decided to move in anyway, and not long after, they began to start hearing bangs and raps. There were footsteps heard on the stairs as well as in the pantry, a variety of different events that were occurring. Now, as far as March 31st, 1848, all four of the family members were in one room as the girls had been quite unsettled and nervous about the events that had been happening in the home, so they slept in their parents' bedroom. On this particular night, although we don't know what it was about this night, that Kate decided to ask Mr. Splitfoot to copy her, and she had clapped her hands and in response received the same number of raps. Maggie decided to give it a try, and she also received the same number of raps in response to hers. However, unlike Kate, Maggie was quite unsettled by this and didn't want to try it again. Their mother decided to find out if this was a, what type of spirit presence it was and decided to ask it to give her the correct ages for all of her children. Of course, the family was quite surprised when the raps did in fact give all the ages correctly. There was a pause and then three more raps, which the family took to mean was an indication of the child who had passed away at three years old. 
How the sp responses were deciphered also varies by the sources. According to Blum, she just mentions that there were knocks, as in two would mean yes, silence would mean no. That would, of course, only work for certain questions. Other sources say that the girls began reciting off the alphabet, and when they heard a knock, that would indicate the correct letter. For anyone who watches paranormal channels, you're well aware that this is what Cody and Satori now do in 2024. Neighbors were invited over to witness the events as the family wanted someone else to verify what was going on. And the neighbors also began to ask questions and were getting the accurate responses. This is when they were told about the peddler who was murdered in the home. And according to one source, the peddler even let them know that the murder had occurred five years before. And it had been a Tuesday at midnight in the East bedroom. This is also when they were told that he was buried in the basement. It was an earth floor downstairs. Sources vary depending on which you read. Some say it was David who had gone down and began digging. Others say that it was the father, John, who began digging. In any case, they did have to stop for a number of months because when they began digging, the cellar had begun to flood. Water was coming up. So they waited until later when things had dried out a bit. And again, sources vary on who did the digging. They do agree that it was five feet down where they found some bones and hair, which were later identified as human. As you can imagine, once word got out, people were very curious. So they began coming to the house at all hours. So there were people around the house wanting to experience the events. There were people peeking in the windows wanting to see. The family finally had enough. Their entire lives were being disrupted. So according to the brief guide, The Supernatural, the family moved in with their older son, David, who lived two miles away. They also at this time had decided perhaps it might be better to separate the girls. So Katie, Kate had gone to live with her sister Leah in Rochester. Maggie stayed with her mom and father at David's house. On the second night after Kate was there, things began to happen. There were taps and noises going on. Leah decided to move. Her mother and Maggie came up and joined her. Again, there were noises, things happening. And it was also during this time they began talking about the responses they were getting, the accuracy. And Leah decided perhaps her sisters could make a living as mediums and things started to flow from there. Their first appearance, according to numerous sources, was at the Corinthian Hall on November the 14th, 1848, so several months after these events had begun in their home. The only source that mentions P.T. Barnum and his American Museum is Deborah Blum. Her information seems to vary quite a bit from the other sources I referred to. So again, I'm not sure who did the research for her or where that information came from. I'll need to look through the bibliographies as well as the notes that are in the book, but it definitely doesn't coincide with the other sources I had referred to. They all talk about the Corinthian Hall, the hall had a number of people in there wanting to experience what was going on, ask questions, that type of thing. There were also committees that were formed to test the girls. 
and a number of different things were done, including patting them down to make sure they weren't hiding anything, people holding their hands or their feet to make sure that that isn't how they were making the sounds. They had undergone a number of different tests throughout the time that they had been doing readings and holding seances. For the girls, it was a no-win situation, as well as for some of the committees who did the testing. Many believed that the girls were frauds. They were quite outspoken about those beliefs. The girls were ridiculed. They were physically attacked. Death threats were even made. It definitely wasn't something that you would just go out and want to try and get this type of attention most people anyway. Believers refused the results when committees said they were frauds. The skeptics believed when they said they were frauds, but of course didn't believe when others said they were legitimate. It was a constant back and forth throughout the entire time, decades that the girls were doing their work. The church was definitely against the growth of the spiritualist movement as it did not require teachings of the Bible. It had to do with speaking to the dead. So there was animosity and issues there as well. In 1851, Mrs. Culver, who was related through marriage to the family, came forward and said that the girls were frauds, had in fact taught her how to do the raps and respond to questions. The other thing that came up though with Mrs. Culver was why did she come forward? What was her motivation in that scenario? There were a number of different things that came up in terms of people who did testing and their motivation as well. 40 years later, so the girls, this is what they had done in terms of a career. They had worked in the United States. Kate had also gone to live in England. They came up to Canada and held seances and did readings for people. But in 1888, Maggie told her story first to the New York Herald, claiming that she and Kate were frauds. Obviously, that sent a massive ripple throughout the spiritualist community, as well as skeptics coming forward saying they knew it all along. It was quite the uproar. In October, both Kate and Maggie were together when they made the announcement to a large crowd. Maggie actually demonstrated how she had made the sounds using joint snapping joints, as should be expected. And again, if you watch some things on YouTube or even watch the news, I guess, in this time, even when things are clearly pointed out, there are still some who will choose to believe what they were believing beforehand. So the skeptics reveled in Maggie's admission. The believers felt betrayed, but they still didn't stop believing in spiritualism and being able to speak to the dead. There, of course, after the girls became more known and articles, there were mediums all over the place, holding seances, doing their table wrappings, what have you. The other twist to the story, of course, is that a year later, Maggie recanted her confession of being a fraud. This, of course, caused yet another uproar throughout the community who had already felt betrayed by Maggie and Kate in the first place. It was not an easy time for either of the girls. They had been working quite a bit throughout their lives. It's hard to say what the motivation was first for coming forward 40 years later to say they were frauds and then recanting that a year later. There is one story that I came across in relation to Maggie 
that close to her death, there had been a neighbor visiting. She lived in a tenement, I believe. And the neighbor was there. Maggie was not in good shape. And there were sounds heard, rapping and knocking sounds, which this individual claims there's no way Maggie could have done that because she was suffering from rheumatism at the time. It leaves it up to the individual to decide whether the girls truly were gifted and speaking to the other side, or was it just a hoax that they were able to perpetuate for over 40 years? The motives, it's hard to say, especially given the time period. It certainly wasn't money. The girls never became rich from working as mediums or the shows that they did. Leah, their older sister, managed their career. She also worked as a medium. And because, of course, all of the uproar and the rest of it, she ended up losing her music pupils. So she focused her time and energy into her sister's career and she also did readings as well for people. It's hard to say in terms of the girls, did they just get swept up in the tide, the attention, one not wanting to admit that perhaps on the 31st of March, it was an April Fool's joke, as Kate is quoted as saying in some of the sources I read, she believed that a neighbor was playing a joke on them. It's really hard to say, and each of the sources, again, vary. Why did Maggie and Kate both come forward? People speculate what is known is that, sadly, between their work schedules and everything else, they both ended up becoming alcoholics. Again, hard to say is that they were trying to block out the information they were getting. Was it just too much. Both of the girls were married. Sadly, they were also both widowed. It really wasn't an easy life for them. What are your thoughts? Do you think Maggie and Kate actually were talking to the dead and getting answers from the spirit world? Do you think someone could pop their joints that number of times, especially when they were in these halls and doing demonstrations? For myself, I have issues with my fingers getting stuck every once in a while and that, and I just can't imagine being able to do it that often. And some people also say that's part of why the girls started Perhaps they were genuine, but because of this schedule that they had, sometimes they were just tired and exhausted. So it was on those occasions that they made the rapping noises using joints rather than other things. It's really hard to say, but after 40 years, Maybe they were just tired of being hounded and threatened and all the other things that went with being a medium in that time period. And maybe they were just tired of being called fake. It's really hard to say. The sources that I referred to for this video were Blythe Spirits. That's an article of a book review, and I'll leave more information about these sources in the description box below. There was an article from the History Channel that I found online, How a Hoax by Two Sisters Helps Spark the Spiritualism Craze. Wikipedia went to the Fox Sisters, and I'm very impressed at how accurate that information was and correlated with the other sources. I was very disappointed by Ghost Hunters by Deborah Blum, as that's the one source that really didn't seem to coincide with the others. Ghost Stories of Ontario by John Robert Colombo. 
His source is one of two that mentions about the family moving from Ontario, Canada. And the Mysteries of Time and Space, Volume 10 series, had a very extensive amount of information on the family, photos of the parents, as well as the girls. It actually was probably the best resource I looked at. That was from 1992. The Blythe Spirits article was quite fascinating because that's a book review that was written about the Fox sisters, but this particular author is looking at what else was happening in that time period. So it really was a fascinating read. As always, thank you so much for the gift of your time. I hope that you enjoyed my episode about the Fox sisters. If you found it to be of interest or of benefit, be sure to click that like button and leave me a comment down below. What are your thoughts about the girls? Were they legit or did they just find a way to make a different kind of living in that time period? Also, be sure to share this out if you know other people that are interested in the Fox sisters. And if you haven't yet and you enjoy content that's quirky and eclectic, then be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you know when I upload content that may be of interest to you. Until next time, take good care.